Hello, church history friends. Welcome. My name is Barb Walden, and I am thrilled that you are joining us tonight as we welcome Quincy Newell, the historian behind this fabulous book. Tonight, she's going to tell us all about the fascinating story of Jane Manning James. So we're happy you're here. Our Evening with the Historians Winter Series is not only a great way to learn church history, it's also a wonderful way to help preserve church heritage. Donations received throughout the Winter Series support the ongoing maintenance and preservation of all five Community of Christ historic sites, in addition to helping fund educational programs and internships. So friends, we couldn't host educational programs like tonight without your generous support. So thank you so much for helping support the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation. And speaking of educational programs, we have an exciting spring schedule filled with church history programs. So get out your calendars, friends, because we have a great spring lineup. April 6th is the 193rd anniversary of the founding of the church and a great day for church history nerds all over the world to gather online to celebrate that heritage. Andrew Bolton will join us that day for a program that will explore the history behind the church seal. His presentation is called History of the Church Seal, War, Peace, and Visual Theology. And you can see on the screen the, the diverse variations that the design of the church seal has taken over the years. So to join us for the April 6th program, head over to our website where you can register and save your seat. We received such positive feedback about last fall's lecture series on the scattered saints and their stories that we're bringing that theme back for our spring lecture series. And we'll have four additional speakers that'll help explore the various Latter-day Saint groups that formed after 1844. So here's what we can look forward to during the spring series, which will run from May 11th through June 1st. Amy De Rogatis uh, will share with us the story of Elvira Eliza Field in a lecture called Charlie's a Gal, James Jesse Strang's first plural wife, Elvira Eliza Field. Uh, in addition to learning about Elvira, Vicki Cleverly Speak will join us one of those weeks during the spring series to talk about polygamy, visions, and power, how the Strangites became RLDS. So we'll definitely get a fill of Michigan and Wisconsin history with uh, James Strang and the Strangite movement. In addition to Strang, we also will be exploring Lyme and White as Melvin Johnson will join us and talk about Lyme and White's group that went to Texas and the community that was created there in Texas. Uh, Lyman's lecture is called Lyme and White, I'm sorry, Melvin's lecture is called Lyme and White and the Mormon Trails in Texas the wild ram and his flock in the death Texas Hill country before 1860. Uh, that'll be a fantastic lecture. And if you're planning to attend the John Whitmer History Conference this September, which will take place in that lime and white country of Texas, this lecture is one you don't wanna miss. Uh, it'll prepare you for that uh, fall conference in September. And then lastly, we have Eric Paul Rogers returning to the lecture stage He's going to give a lecture about uh, the Morisites, and his lecture is called From Morisite to Josephite and Beyond. You may remember Eric Paul Rogers uh, presented last spring a great lecture on Mark Hill Forscott, uh, who happened to have been a Morisite that later joined the reorganization. Um, Eric Paul Rogers will be coming back to tell us a little bit more about the Morisite movement and others who were Morisites that later joined the reorganization and beyond, as the lecture says. So we have a lot to cover this spring, and I couldn't be more excited. But enough about the future, let's focus on tonight. Uh, joining me this evening is Peter Smith from sunny Florida. Peter is co-hosting and helping manage things from behind the scenes, and I'm thrilled to see him tonight. So now, let me tell you all about tonight's guest historian, uh, Dr. Quincy Newell. She is the professor of religious studies at Hamilton College. Uh, she's published several books and essays on the experiences of religious and racial slash ethnic minorities in the American West. Among other honors, uh, Newell received the 2018 Jane Dempsey Douglas Prize from the American Society of Church History 
and the 2017 best article in Mormon Women's History um, Prize from the Mormon History Association for her work on Jane Manning James. So Dr. Newell's presentation for tonight is called The Story of Jane, and I couldn't be more excited to welcome her. So thank you, Qu Quincy, for taking the time this evening to share with us. I'll turn the spotlight over to you as we are all more than ready to hear the story of Jane. Well, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. And I wanna, I wanna thank everybody for coming this evening. And I especially want to thank Barb Walden for inviting me to speak with you and for that lovely introduction. I'm really delighted to be here with you in this virtual space. And I'm excited to share the story of Jane Elizabeth Manning James with you. Now, who is Jane Elizabeth Manning James, you might ask? Well, what a great question that is. A free black woman born in Connecticut in the early 1820s, Jane Elizabeth Manning James entered domestic service at a young age. She moved to Illinois as a young adult, and then she joined the mass movement of Americans into the Trans-Mississippi American West in the late 1840s. She raised a large family and she was active in her community until her death in 1908. Now, I'll refer to her as Jane tonight because she used three different surnames during her life. Most importantly for historians, Jane's life is comparatively well-documented. She left multiple accounts narrating her personal history, some of which were published during her lifetime. And she appears in many other sources, including other people's diaries, meeting minutes, and church and government records. The story of her life opens up new angles for us on the histories of African Americans, American religion, American women, and the American West. Nevertheless, Jane's story is left out of books on these areas of American history. And I think that's because she was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which I'll refer to as the LDS Church tonight. Consider one of Jane's contemporaries, a woman we know as Bridget Biddy Mason. Born into slavery, Bridget was the legal property of Latter-day Saint convert Robert Marion Smith, who took her and other enslaved people to Utah in 1847 and then to California in 1851. In 1855, Bridget sued for her freedom and that of her extended family in order to keep Smith from moving them all to Texas. She prevailed, winning the freedom of 14 people in all. Bridget chose the surname Mason and established a successful medical practice in the Los Angeles area. She purchased land, built a home for her family, and was a leader in the group that established the Los Angeles branch of the First African Methodist Episcopal Church. Mason died in 1891. Although Mason left a uh, left a far smaller paper trail than Jane. Scholars include her story in histories of African Americans, American women, and the American West because it fits the larger tales we want to tell. Jane's story, in contrast, does not. Although modern historians may acknowledge the radicalism of the early Mormon movement, they generally see the LDS Church as a socially and politically conservative institution that has subjected women and people of color to discrimination and oppression. Now, it is true that women's power in the institution has been systematically eroded over the course of its history. And the ideology of white supremacy has certainly influenced the distribution of power, the attitudes of members, and the practice of the religion. Still, the story is more complex than this simple account acknowledges. In some times and some places, women have wielded considerable power within the church. In some ways, people of color have found liberation in the church instead of oppression. But Jane's membership in the LDS church leads many observ observers to see her as a dupe or a victim, someone who was deluded by false promises or exploited by a dishonest institution. While Mason's story illustrates the move from slavery to freedom, Jane seems to go in the opposite direction, choosing to affiliate with a religious organization that treats her as a second-class citizen. 
Mason's story shows women acting independently and successfully in the public sphere. Jane submitted to the will of the white men who led her church. Mason's story provides an example of a black woman actively nurturing community institutions in the West. Jane seems only to have contributed to the construction of a semi-theocratic society that privileged white men. So if you're an American historian, whose story fits better into your narrative? For most folks, it's Biddy Mason. So this evening, I'm going to tell you some stories about Jane's life and talk about how including Jane's experience in four areas of American history might change the way we think about those grand narratives. Jane's life expands our understanding of 19th century African-American history beyond the standard narratives of slavery and freedom, the founding of black churches, and even the long fight for civil rights. It illuminates geographic regions like rural Connecticut and urban Utah, and religious options like congregationalism and Mormonism that are not often discussed in African-American history. So Jane's experience changes our understanding of African-American history and especially of African-American religion. Looking at Mormon history from Jane's perspective, from the point of view of a black woman rather than a white man, we get a very different sense of the development and experience of the 19th century LDS church as well. So Jane's story helps us tell the history of American religions in a new way. Third, Jane's life broadens our sense of 19th century American women's lives. Jane's entire life was shaped by her identity as a woman and a struggle to conform to the gender norms of her community. Her experience demonstrates how those norms constrained her opportunities and made her vulnerable to attack, even as they offered some kinds of support and community not available to men. And finally, Jane's story improves our understanding of the history of the 19th century American West by increasing our knowledge of African Americans' lives in the region. Grappling with Jane's presence in Utah also helps us acknowledge the ways race shaped Western societies. Jane's experience demonstrates that even when the societies were overwhelmingly white, they still wrestled with the construction and meaning of whiteness and other racial identities. So when we include Jane and people like her, people who work against the grain of our standard narratives, the stories we tell about American history become more complicated, more nuanced, and more interesting and let me be clear, we could probably do some form of this exercise with many relatively obscure historical figures. The grand narratives of history are by definition synthetic. They must exclude much that is contradictory. They have to lack nuance. So what I'm saying here is not no, because Jane, rather I'm saying yes, and also Jane. I'm reminding us that these narratives are incomplete. And that if we dig deeper, if we go further, they get way more interesting. Only a handful of African Americans joined the LDS church during Jane's lifetime. And even fewer made the treks to Nauvoo, Illinois and to Utah's Salt Lake Valley. Tracing the life of Jane James reveals some of the less frequently trodden paths, sometimes open to 19th century African American women and men. Jane's story expands our understanding of the range of possibilities for African Americans, and especially African American women, in the 19th century. And as a result, it shifts our sense of possibility for our time. First, let me introduce you to Jane. Jane Elizabeth Manning was born in Wilton, Connecticut in the early 1820s. Her mother had grown up in slavery, but was emancipated before Jane was born. Her father died when she was a young girl, and Jane went to work for a wealthy elderly white couple in New Canaan, Connecticut, about six miles from her family's home. She converted to Mormonism as a young woman when she heard a missionary preach, and she seems to have brought the rest of her family into the church. In 1843, they joined an interracial group of converts from Southwest Connecticut and headed to Nauvoo, Illinois, where the church was then based. In 
Jane later remembered that when they got to Buffalo, New York, the Black members of the group were refused passage on the boat that was to take them to Cleveland. So instead, they walked the 728 miles to Nauvoo. When they got there, Jane worked as a servant in the home of Joseph Smith, the religion's founder. When he was killed in 1844, she went to work for Brigham Young, who many believers recognized as Smith's successor. She married Isaac James, another Black convert, and they moved to Utah with the LDS Church. They were in one of the first companies to reach the Salt Lake Valley in 1847. Jane lived in Salt Lake for the rest of her life. She divorced her first husband in 1870. She briefly married another Black convert, but that relationship only lasted about two years. Her first husband returned in 1890, 20 years after the divorce, and lived in her home, though we don't know if they remarried. He died the following year. Jane was active in the church and spent a great deal of energy requesting permission to perform the temple ceremonies that she believed were necessary for her salvation and that of her family. But because she was Black, her temple access was restricted. She could be, and she was, baptized for her dead family members, one of the three main rituals performed in temples. But the other two rituals were closed to her. She was not allowed to receive her endowment, the Latter-day Saint language, for participating in the initiation ceremony that all Latter-day Saints are supposed to perform. And she was not allowed to do sealing rituals. That's sealing as in binding together, not as in what's above our heads. Latter-day Saints believe that temple sealings, marriages, and adoptions create family relationships that last for eternity. According to LDS theology, without these ceremonies, Jane's connections to her family members were severed when she died in 1908, and she was unable to reach the highest degree of glory in the afterlife. For historians of American religion, one of the key developments in African American religious history is the late 18th century rise of independent Black Protestant denominations, like the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia, and the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church in New York. These churches consolidated their institutional identities in the first decades of the 19th century, right around the time that Jane was born. As the crow flies, Jane lived relatively close to the birthplaces of these churches, but in practical terms, she lived worlds away. Wilton, Connecticut, where she was born, and New Canaan, Connecticut, where she worked, had very small Black populations and no Black churches at all. The creation of independent Black denominations coincided with another important movement in American history, which historians have come to call the Second Great Awakening. This movement swept the United States from the late 1700s into the 1830s, and it marked the first time that Black people in the US became Christians in large numbers. We know that Jane's mother was baptized in 1795, possibly under the influence of the Second Great Awakening, but we have no record of Jane being baptized as a child, even though the majority of churches in their area practiced infant baptism. Eventually though, when she was about 20 years old and the unwed mother of a toddler, Jane got baptized and joined the New Canaan Congregational Church. She did not give a reason for joining. Perhaps she simply felt that it was an appropriate step to take as she came of age. It may also have been a strategic decision. Jane's employer may have expressed some concern about the morality of Jane's behavior when Jane became pregnant. And joining the church could have been a way to assuage that discomfort. It is also possible that Jane hoped to gain access to the church's disciplinary system in case she needed to lodge a complaint against her son's father or another local man. Jane may also have found the church's message compelling. Whatever her reasons, Jane officially joined the church 182 years and nine days ago on February 14, 1841. Now, this move was a little bit unusual, but given the lack of black churches in the area, it's the closest Jane could get to what we might call normative religion for an African-American woman before the Civil War. 
It's in what happened next that Jane really connected with the Second Great Awakening while departing from the standard narrative in a radical fashion. In her autobiography, she recorded the, that the Congregational Church wasn't cutting it. Quote, I did not feel satisfied, she wrote. It seemed to me there was something more that I was looking for, unquote. About a year and a half after her congregational baptism, she went to hear a Mormon missionary preach. Mormonism had begun during the Second Great Awakening, finding traction in the religious enthusiasm of the movement. Jane's conversion story is brief, and for those of us who expect conversions to be full of emotion and supernatural drama, as many evangelical conversion stories of the time were, her story is surprisingly dry. Jane recalled that she, quote, was fully convinced that it was the true gospel the missionary presented and she must embrace it, unquote. A week later, she was baptized and confirmed as a member of the Mormon movement. Now, it's worth keeping in mind that Jane narrated this experience six decades or more after the fact, because it fits the contours of a 19th century LDS conversion narrative to a T. The rationalistic conclusion that since Mormons had a superior gospel, conversion was the only logical response, was a formula that repeated itself in conversion story after conversion story. So Jane's religious choices in her young adulthood set us up to think about alternative trajectories for 19th century African Americans, religious paths that might begin in the traditional way, unchurched until the religious enthusiasm of the Second Great Awakening, then affiliation with a Protestant denomination, but paths that take some unexpected turns. Sorry, I was just distracted by what sounds like some thunder coming from outside my house someplace. Um, I'm hoping that's what it is. So Jane joined a denomination that we don't generally talk about in connection to African American religion, the Congregational Church. And then as far as the traditional narrative goes, she basically abandoned ship when she joined the Mormon movement. But perhaps Jane's decision to seek the something more that she was missing in this unorthodox way should not be all that surprising. Other prominent African-Americans pursued religious truths in unexpected places as well. Sojourner Truth, for example, the well-known activist in the abolition and women's rights movements followed the prophet Matthias for some time. Harriet Jacobs, author of Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, practiced spiritualism. Against this backdrop, Jane's decision to join the Mormons starts to look less surprising. We start to notice that not being an ordinary Protestant was a more common choice among African Americans in the 19th century than the traditional narrative lets on. This helps us ask all sorts of interesting new questions. What did African Americans find compelling in Protestantism and in other alternatives? What other ways of being religious were available to African Americans in the 19th century? And what costs and benefits did each bring? Jane's story also prompts us to look at the history of Mormonism in a new way. Most accounts of Mormonism begin with the founder, Joseph Smith, and continue by tracing the establishment of the institutional LDS church, the development of the LDS church's theology and ritual practice, and the political and economic history of the group's journey to and settlement in Utah, often in the context of the church's clashes with local, state, and federal governments. The RLDS church, the reorganization, other Mormon movements are often entirely left out of this story. This is a story of white men and occasionally of the white women who supported them. In this story, priesthood authority is a key theme and temples are crucial locations. But priesthood authority, the ability to act in God's name, which was granted almost universally to Latter-day Saint men, was withheld from almost all black men who were members of the church and LDS temples where Latter-day Saints perform ceremonies they believe are crucial to their salvation were almost wholly closed to Black saints. So from Jane's perspective, the story looks different. Because the temple was mostly unavailable to her and her family, 
Jane constructed her religious identity, at least in part, around direct encounters with the divine and the sense that flowed from these encounters that God was on her side. Jane had experiences like this throughout her life. Supernatural healings were one form in which Jane interacted with the divine. For example, in 1896, Jane told a gathering of LDS women about healing herself. The secretary who reported on the meeting put it this way, quote, Sister Jane James bore a faithful testimony and said she had been terribly afflicted in her head and she took her consecrated oil and anointed herself and she was healed, felt that that was faith and praised the Lord for her blessings, unquote. Jane also received visions from the Holy Spirit. The most dramatic episode was her experience of doing the Smith family's laundry shortly after being hired as a domestic servant in Nauvoo. Quote, among the clothes I found Brother Joseph's robes, Jane recalled in her autobiography. I looked at them and wondered. I had never seen any before, and I pondered over them and thought about them so earnestly that the Spirit made manifest to me that they pertained to the new name that is given the saints that the world knows not of. I didn't know when I washed them or when I put them out to dry, unquote. The new name that Jane mentioned was a reference to the temple endowment ritual, suggesting that although temple ceremonies were supposed to be secret, Jane received information about them directly from God. Perhaps the most frequent charismatic experience in Jane's life was speaking in tongues a practice that was very familiar to early Mormons. Jane's first recorded instance of speaking in tongues was shortly after her conversion. In her autobiography, Jane recalled, quote, about three weeks after baptism, while kneeling at prayer, the gift of tongues came upon me and frightened the whole family who were in the next room, unquote. For Jane, this experience confirm confirmed her decision to join the Mormon movement. Apart from this one, Jane's recorded experiences of speaking in tongues occurred in social settings where their value in encouraging and comforting the saints was clear. In seeking and valuing charismatic experiences like these, Jane was very similar to many members of the movement she joined in the 1840s. Scholar Janet Ellingson has shown that early Mormons experienced spiritual gifts like healing, visions, and speaking in tongues quite regularly. Moreover, Ellingson argued, many people who became Mormons regularly experienced spiritual gifts before their conversion, and they converted to Mormonism because it, it accepted and valued these experiences. So paired with Jane's accounts of charismatic experiences, Ellingson's provocative argument suggests a new interpretation of Jane's conversion narrative. Remember, Jane said that she left the Congregational Church because, quote, it seemed to me there was something more that I was looking for, unquote. Ellingson's argument suggests that the something more Jane sought was a place where her charismatic experiences were recognized and encouraged. Jane's ability to construct a rich, satisfying religious life within the LDS Church, along with her, persi her persistent campaign, to receive her endowments and be sealed, highlights the ways Latter-day Saint religious experience moved physically, geographically, during the LDS Church's first century. For Latter-day Saints now, as scholar Kathleen Flake writes, temple ritual is the, quote, privileged source of LDS truth, unquote. And it's easy to read that interpretation of the tradition back into the 19th century. But Jane's story shows us that would be a mistake. From Jane's angle, lack of temple access takes a back seat to charismatic experiences. Jane's encounters with the divine allowed her to fit in with other early Mormons and to construct a religious identity that affirmed the proposition that God interacted actively with humans in ways that echoed Joseph Smith's own experiences. This perspective moves us away from Latter-day Saint doctrine and toward the lived religion of 19th century Mormons, acknowledging their sense that Mormonism accepted and valued their charismatic experiences 
regardless of whether those experiences occurred in temples. It also highlights the continuities between early Mormonism and other revivalistic forms of Christianity, which often found evidence of divine encounter in experiences like tongues and other bodily sensations. Just as Jane's story encourage us, encourages us to look at American religious history from new angles, it also helps us think about the history of American women in new ways. One of the main themes in 19th century American women's history centers around social reform movements, abolition, temperance, women's suffrage, and a host of other efforts to make society better in all sorts of ways. Jane participated in exactly none of these efforts, as far as the historical record indicates. And yet we can see clearly the ways in which her life was shaped by 19th century gender norms. She worked almost her entire life to be considered a good Mormon woman. That Jane was black had a profound effect both on what was expected of her and what obstacles she had to overcome to meet the norms of Latter-day Saint femininity. So her life is a great illustration of intersectionality the idea that our identities, our race, our gender, our religion, overlap and shape one another in important ways. In 1889, Jane received a patriarchal blessing from John Smith, who was then the presiding patriarch of the LDS church. John Smith was the nephew of the church founder, Joseph Smith. As patriarch, John Smith served as a father figure to the entire community. Following the examples of the patriarchs of the Hebrew Bible and the presiding patriarchs who had preceded him, he bestowed blessings on church members. Sociologists Gary Shepard, Gordon Shepard, and Natalie Shepard wrote that for early Mormons like Jane, patriarchal blessings, quote, were considered to be the inspired word of God addressed directly and personally to individual blessing recipients, and thus an important form of prophetic revelation, unquote. John Smith placed his hands on Jane's head and following the prompting of the Holy Spirit, pronounced a blessing on her. Someone else stood by to record Smith's words. Jane would treasure this written record of her blessing for the rest of her life. Smith reassured Jane that despite her frustrations in life, things would turn out well in the end. Quote, let thy heart be comforted. Look always upon the bright side, for better days await thee, Smith told Jane. Thou shalt complete thy mission and receive thine inheritance among the saints, and thy name shall be handed down to posterity in honorable remembrance, unquote. Jane needed this reassurance. Although she had been permitted to perform baptisms for her dead, she had not received the temple privileges that she had been requesting for years by the time John Smith laid his hands on her head. She must have been tired of fighting for the blessings white saints took for granted. The patriarchal blessing assured her that her struggle was not in vain. Quote, the Lord has heard thy, peti thy petitions, Smith comforted Jane. He knowest the secrets of thy heart. He has witnessed thy trials. And although thy life has been somewhat checkered, his hand has been over thee for good, and thou shalt verily receive thy reward." Unquote. Smith's reference to Jane's checkered past was a clue to how Jane's white co-religionists viewed her history. Unlike white saints, Jane had to overcome prejudice that painted her as lazy, ignorant, and immoral. Latter-day Saints used stories from the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and other LDS scriptures to justify their discrimination against Black people like Jane. Her first son had been born out of wedlock and continued to be a subject of gossip in her community, even though he was 50 years old by then. But John Smith promised Jane that, quote, for thy kindness, many shall bless thee in thine old age. And as a mother in Israel, thou shalt be known among the people, unquote. Mother in Israel was the highest honorific that could be bestowed on a Mormon woman. The title was reserved for the most respected women in the community, 
some of whom Jane turned to for help in requesting temple rituals. To be told that she too would be known as a mother in Israel, despite her checkered past and her restricted temple access, must have been comforting for Jane. But despite the promise of her patriarchal blessing, Latter-day Saints did not apply this label to Jane during her lifetime. Jane's obituary noted that she was, quote, familiarly known as Aunt Jane, unquote. And even though that title conveyed respect, it also bore racial connotations. Scholars Patricia J. Soterin and Laura L. Ellingson wrote that, quote, while bestowing the aunt title upon a woman unrelated by blood or marriage is often a positive mark of affection and recipro reciprocal obligation among perceived peers, the title aunt traditionally signified the elevation of the Bami among, uh, sorry, above other servants who were addressed by first name, while withholding the authority and legitimacy afforded by being addressed formally as Mr. or Mistress. Unquote. Soterin and Ellingson's point is apt in Jane's case. Almost without exception, no publication about Jane ever re referred to her as Mrs. Isaac James, or even as Mrs. Jane James. Instead, if Jane received a title, it was Sister Jane James, or Aunt Jane. Sometimes the condescension was even more bold as in an unsigned 1906 Salt Lake Herald article that consistently referred to white women as Miss or Mrs. So-and-so, as in Miss C.R. Savage drew a picture of Mrs. Margaret Hart, while calling Jane Auntie Jane, as in Auntie Jane wore a spotless white waist, little poke bonnet, and white apron. Sotrin and Ellingson noted the title aunt can reflect a socioeconomic boundary, linking the woman's position to the family while marking her as essentially outside of the family unit. Servants, slaves or economically disadvantaged women, particularly immigrants and minorities, historically have been designated aunt, unquote. So for white Latter-day Saints to call Jane Aunt Jane connected her to the community while also relegating her to a subservient role. Jane spent the majority of her life trying to fit into her community's standards for women, their definition of femininity. Her autobiography is a pretty transparent attempt to, de to demonstrate that she checked all the boxes. She was married, she gave birth to eight kids, she was pious and industrious, and she submitted to her church leadership. She had all the makings of a mother in Israel, as John, Prom John Smith promised she would be known. But she was also Black, unlike, unlike most Latter-day Saint women. And so her family could not fit the pattern for Latter-day Saint families. Her husband did not hold the LDS priesthood. He wasn't allowed to. Jane and her husband Isaac weren't sealed to one another in the temple because that wasn't allowed either. Jane's family would not, could not, stay together for eternity because Black people were not allowed into the covenant that said families are forever. So Jane's womanhood was shaped by her Blackness in ways that were inescapable and she believed eternal. As far as Jane knew, she would always be Aunt Jane, never a mother in Israel. What that Blackness meant, theologically, socially, politically, was a moving target during Jane's lifetime. And paying attention to those shifting meanings and their real world consequences helps us see some of the hidden history of race in the American West. Although the LDS Church was overwhelmingly white when its members settled in Salt Lake, questions of race vexed the institution and its members throughout the 19th century and beyond. John Smith's blessing may have encouraged Jane to believe that her struggle for her temple privileges would ultimately succeed. In February 1890, she wrote a letter to Joseph F. Smith, the half-brother of Patriarch John Smith and another nephew of church founder Joseph Smith. Joseph F. Smith was, at the time, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, the highest governing body of the church. Jane wrote, quote, 
Can I also be adopted in Brother Joseph Smith's, the prophet's family? I think you are somewhat acquainted with me. I lived in the prophet's family with Emma, Joseph Smith's first wife, and others about a year. And Emma said Joseph told her to tell me I could be adopted in their family. She asked me if I should like to. I did not understand the law of adoption then, but understanding it now, can that be accomplished and when?" Unquote. This request reiterated one Jane had made in an 1884 letter to the president of the church, one she would make several more times during the years that remained to her. In her autobiography, dictated sometime between 1902 and her death in 1908, Jane again repeated the story and lamented her ignorance. I did not comprehend, she said. In the early 1840s, around the time Jane said Emma offered her adoption into Joseph Smith's family, the prophet introduced the idea of sealing family members together in an eternal family unit. In time, as scholar Jonathan Stapley wrote, quote, kinship, priesthood, and salvation became synonymous, unquote, in the LDS church. This understanding of adoption sealing, linking familial relationships with salvation and essentially making salvation conditional on the eternal preservation of those family relationships, explains why Jane was so intent on being sealed. Without that ritual, she would be single and alone in the eternities. Jane's request to be adopted into Joseph Smith's family was far from unusual. Unlike most people who applied to be adopted to Joseph Smith, she bolstered her request with stories, likely in an effort to overcome the resistance that an interracial adoption might meet. In Jane's eyes, this ritual would not create a completely different relationship between her and Joseph. It would fulfill the potential she had sensed in her relationship with the, with the prophet. Quote, he used to be just like I was his child, she said in a 1905 interview. She reinforced this view of Joseph Smith as a kindly, generous, paternal figure in other accounts as well. But the white men who led the LDS church understood the ideal composition of earthly and eternal families somewhat differently than did Jane. And they balked at the idea of giving Joseph Smith a black daughter in eternity. Worn down by Jane's persistent requests, they created a new ritual as a compromise between her, her wish and their reservations. And so, sorry, long slide, there we go. Okay. So on May 18, 1894, Zina D.H. Young, Joseph F. Smith, the officiant, John R. Winder, and two witnesses went to a sealing room in the Salt Lake Temple. Jane was not with them. She was not allowed in that part of the temple. Instead, Young stood as a proxy for Jane. Joseph F. Smith similarly represented his deceased uncle, Joseph Smith. The officiant began by asking a question meant for Jane. Quote, Jane Elizabeth Manning, do you wish to be attached as a servitor for eternity to the prophet Joseph Smith and in this capacity be connected with his family and be obedient to him in all things in the Lord as a faithful servitor?" Unquote. Jane had probably had not been told ahead of time what questions would be asked in the ceremony. She may not even have known exactly how the connection between her and Joseph Smith would be framed. So when Young responded yes to this question, her answer was not based on Jane's expressed wishes, but on Young's understanding of Jane's best interest. After Joseph F. Smith affirmed on his uncle's behalf that he, quote, wished to receive Jane Elizabeth Manning as a servitor to himself and family, end quote, the officiant declared, quote, by the authority given me of the Lord, I pronounce you, Jane Elizabeth Manning, a servitor to the prophet Joseph Smith and to his household for all eternity through your faithfulness in the new and everlasting covenant in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen." Unquote. 
With that pronouncement, made in a temple room she could not enter, in front of people who acted on her behalf, Jane's eternal status changed. She would no longer be alone for eternity. Instead, she would serve Joseph Smith's family, just as she had done in Nauvoo. The ceremony was an unsatisfactory compromise for both Jane and the church leaders who authorized it. The ritual was never performed again, an indication that church leaders did not find it an effective means of structuring eternal relationships. For her part, Jane saw the ceremony as progress, but not enough. The minutes of a 1902 meeting of church leaders recorded that, quote, Aunt Jane was not satisfied with the ceremony, and as a mark of her dissatisfaction, she applied again after this for sealing blessings, but of course in vain, unquote. This sealing ceremony demonstrates just how inescapable the question of race was in the 19th century. For much of its history, white people were one of several racial or ethnic groups in the American West, and they were not the majority. Yet even in places like Salt Lake City, where white people were the overwhelming majority, Latter-day Saints still had to wrestle with the construction and consequences of racial categories. Was race an eternal aspect of identity or could it change? Could families include people of different races? What were the theological meanings of racial identities? These questions forced the Latter-day Saints to exercise some ritual creativity as we see in the sealing ceremony that I just described. And they continued to torment Latter-day Saints all the way through the 20th century. The picture that is used most often to illustrate stories of Jane James is a likeness made in the late 1860s in the studio of Edward Martin. But we're not actually sure the woman in this image was Jane. Nobody in the 19th century recorded the subject of this photo, so we can guess that it's her, but we can't be 100% certain. We are reasonably sure, on the other hand, that it's Jane who appears in this photo which I actually think is a much better illustration of her life. Whereas the previous photo shows a woman in isolation, separate from the social and political and religious contexts that shaped her life, this photo shows Jane in the midst of those contexts, surrounded by white faces, barely visible among all the other details. But once we know she's there, our perception of the entire scene shifts slightly and opens up new questions for us to ask about this gathering and the histories that created it. In the same way, I hope that now that you know a little bit about Jane's story, your perception of American history has shifted just a little bit, that you have some new questions to ask about African American history, American religious history, American women's history, and the history of the American West and some new angles you might try out in thinking about those narratives. Thank you so much. I can't thank you enough, Quincy, for sharing your knowledge with us tonight. Uh, we have learned so much and it has led to so many more questions. Uh, Jane had an incredible story and a painful story. And I think you really highlighted um, the, the meaning behind her story and what Jane means to us today. So thank you so much for, for sharing with us. And Thank you very much for having me. It's our pleasure. And friends, if you have not already purchased uh, your copy of Quincy's book, Your Sister in the Gospel, The Life of Jane Manning James, a 19th century Black Mormon, I encourage you to head over to the redbrickstore.com to pick up your copy today. And Peter's going to drop a link into the chats to make it even easier for you. Uh, if you enjoyed tonight's lecture, I can um, say with great confidence that there's even more great material in this book. It's a really, really good biography. And lastly, thank you to everyone here for sharing your evening with us. I hope you will all join us this spring as we explore the history behind the church seal on April 6th with Andrew Bolton and throughout the month of May and into June as we explore the stories of the scattered saints in our spring lecture series. So until next time, take care, everyone. Keep reading your church history.
and have a good night.